I bring you greetings from your sister congregation, Naples United Church of Christ. And as my dear friend Laura said, yes, a place of paradise that you are welcomed anytime, but I recommend not coming this time of year because you'll notice I left to be with you <laughs> this time of year. And it is such a privilege to be in this great pulpit, in this great church, and with such a great friend as Reverend Laura Fragan, whose story is a part of my story from many years ago. Are you moving on to perfection? That is one of the great questions of ordination in the United Methodist Church. And I was prepared to answer that question when a bishop would ask it. It is such a historic question that every ordinand in the United Methodist Church throughout history has answered it. And just in case you're wondering, the expected answer is yes. It's rooted in the founding of the United Methodist Church and in its founder, John Wesley. And because I was on track to become a United Methodist pastor, I was prepared that when a bishop asked me that question, I would look directly in their eye and with full confidence answer, yes. Are you moving on to perfection. And actually, speaking of my ministry, I was on an inside track, if I'm honest, in the United Methodist Church. My father, aunt, and uncle are all United Methodist ministers. My father was serving one of the 10 largest churches in the Texas Conference. My uncle led a large department of spiritual care in a hospital in the medical center in Houston. My aunt was serving as senior minister of the largest church led by a woman in the world. I had served as the youngest delegate to the denomination's highest body, the General Conference. I had attended a United Methodist undergraduate college and I was on my way to a United Methodist related seminary, of course, the one that my father, aunt, and uncle had attended. And just to make it just the perfect story, my kid brother matriculated with me to that same seminary. In the intervening years between undergraduate and starting seminary, I had served on staff of a large church in West Houston where I had helped lead a capital campaign that we launched the day after 9-11. I was as about United Methodist as they are made. And so yes, I could envision years hence looking in the eyes of a bishop when they asked, are you moving on to perfection and saying, Yes. And perfection is an interesting idea, isn't it? When it's referenced in our scripture today, in the closing verse, it says this, Be perfect, therefore, as your Abba God is perfect. As my First Testament professor in seminary would say, it's a nice line, and it would look good cross-stitched on the pillow in the guest room, but what does it actually mean? Because we can't forget and we can't lose sight that this perfection that is referenced means that we are perfect in forgiving our enemies. And perhaps people in California and Los Angeles and here at First Congregational are a little better at forgiving your enemies than we are in Florida, but 
I will speak for those of us in Naples, we need a little help in forgiving our enemies. And doesn't it seem like that in our world and in our nation today? It's not that we can't even love our enemies, we can't even speak to them. The vitriol in our culture has seemingly taken us to a deafening level. If you are not the same ethnicity, gender expression, sexual orientation, theological identity, or immigration status as me, then we seem to not be interested in dialogue. Notice I didn't say debate, I said dialogue. We have forgotten how to talk to one another. We seem eager to tell each other who is in and who is out. And failing to tell each other that we are all loved by God, perfectly loved by God. My family had to discover this in a unique way when I came out to them as a gay man in February of 2002. I had graduated college the previous May and was working full time, discerning what my next big step would be. I was working at the church in Houston as I talked about. And I was facing a dilemma that actually not many 20 year olds face. I actually loved my job. I worked six days a week. I made decent money, but I was never going to get rich. And every morning, I loved going to work at a church. When I came to that job, I was told that I had been hired for one year. And as that year was drawing to a close, it was time for me to decide what was next. But I would actually been offered a permanent position on the staff. But it involved preaching on a regular basis, and I knew that that would raise my visibility. And so I didn't feel comfortable accepting that position without being fully honest to my boss and my mentor about who I am, a child of God who is gay and called to ministry. So on a Friday afternoon, I sat in my office and I counted up how much money was in my savings account, in my checking account, and how much cash I had in my pocket. Because if I told him and he fired me on the spot, I wanted to know how long I could make it financially. So I walked into his office that Friday afternoon and I told him, I'm turning down your generous offer. He asked me why, and I hemmed and hawed around the answer. And I finally looked at him, I said, Chuck, I'm gay. And he looked back at me and said, when have I ever convinced you that I care? So I changed my mind and accepted that job. And since I was making so many big decisions that weekend, I decided I should probably come out to my parents as well. (laughs) So I called them that evening and asked if I could come up and see them the next day and go to dinner. So I made my way to North Houston. After taking the LSAT that morning because I was convinced maybe I'd go to law school, I walked into my parents' home and I said, you know, before going for Chinese food, there's something we need to talk about. I'll never forget the weight that was lifted from my shoulders as I said the words, I need you to know something about me, something that I've been struggling with for a while, but no longer have shame about. I am a gay man. With those three words, While I didn't know it at the time, I turned my family, my father's career, and my future upside down. But what I did know was that I was moving on to perfection. 
It was a tearful evening. There were some knee-jerk things said in the moment of fear and surprise. Keeping in mind, of course, that just before that conversation, my mother had asked me dressing advice for church the next day. So I wasn't sure where the surprise came in. And it was quite possibly the most awkward family meal we have ever eaten. But we got through it. And I came back the next week and we had another family awkward, uh, awkward family meal, but we got through it. And we kept having awkward family meals until they weren't awkward anymore. And as a family, we were moving on to perfection. Fast forward five years, I am now a graduate student in seminary at Southern Methodist University. The United Methodist Church still to this day has a ban on the ordination of openly gay and practicing clergy. And I realized that my soul was being eaten away. And I once again found myself questioning if I wanted to serve the church. And so in a fit of frustration, I called my aunt and she guided me to Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ. I made an appointment with the senior minister. I shared my story with her and she shared her story with me as a lesbian who had also left the Methodist church. And then she said the most amazing thing to me. She said, Dawson, there is an adoptive family waiting to love and celebrate you fully for who you are. Shortly after I graduated seminary, I took a job there at Cathedral of Hope and was ordained 13 years ago this month. The challenge, however, came that I was co-chairing a global board of the Methodist Church, and as I left the denomination of my birth, baptism, and confirmation, the United Methodist News Service ran a story about my departure, and that began to make waves in my father's large suburban Houston congregation. And he came under attack, first by significant donors who withheld resources, even asking to meet with my father at one of their offices and questioning him about what he believed about the inherency of Scripture. This later caused my father to write an open letter to the congregation telling our family's personal story and ending with this. I prayed for a year that God would change Dawson or change me. And I can now say with full confidence that God answers prayer and God changed me. He might have survived those attacks, but if you know a lot about my father, he married a rather strong woman, my mother. She is a retired educator and, a, and at the time was sponsoring the Gay Straight Alliance at the local high school. At, around that same time, a group of students came to her and wanted to march in the Houston Gay Pride Parade. She helped that happen. My father was none too pleased about this idea. And as she left that evening to go to the parade, he said, just don't end up on the news. If I've learned nothing else from being raised in the home that I was and surrounded by the professional women that I am and reading of scripture is that enlightened men never tell women what to do. That night, my mother not only became the sponsor of the first Gay Straight Alliance to march in the Houston Gay Pride Parade, but she also gave an in-depth interview to the Houston Chronicle becoming a front page story, but honoring her word to my dad that she would not, quote, end up on the news. My father, the next morning, came downstairs preparing to go to church, opened the paper, and immediately knew that trouble was on its way. And sure enough, it did. Not only did giving tank and attendance shortly thereafter, but people did very loving things like the Sunday school class that voted to boycott worship until my father was removed as the senior minister. 
And sure enough, several months later, the bishop placed my father on leave in hopes that the conflict around him would simmer down, but it never did. Ultimately, my father had to leave that congregation after doubling their budget, doubling their worship attendance, wiping out their debt, and expanding their campus. However, I must say that my father never went a day without a paycheck or a home. The bishop ultimately placed him on her cabinet as a district superintendent where he served for seven years until his retirement. I served Cathedral of Hope for nearly eight years, ultimately leaving to become associate minister at Naples United Church of Christ in Florida. And then two years was, a year ago was named senior minister at the time of my predecessor's retirement. I am not a perfect pastor. Naples United Church of Christ is not a perfect church. And my family is far from a perfect family, having just been on vacation with them for a week. <laughs> However, I can tell you that all of us are moving on to for perfection. For so long, we kept score about who was against us and who was for us. We worried about what people thought. And honestly, we held a lot of anger and resentment toward enemies. But those days have mostly passed. Except for my mother, don't mess with her. Someone once asked the artist, Michelangelo, how it was that he was able to carve the statue David. He responded, I saw the angel in the marble and chiseled until I set it free. My friends, I came from Florida today to say that we must keep chiseling the marble until all of our angels are set free. We must chisel until our whole selves are free for the world to see. Simply put, we must keep chiseling until we are perfect and can love our enemies perfectly. May it begin today in this holy and beautiful place.